when the subcommittee finds itself, um, and then uh, a few of the priority actions that the subcommittee feels strongly about. Um, the packet of accomplishments as well as planned actions are in your book. No, actually, their handbook. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll have those. And what I would choose to do is not read them back to you. Um, so I'm going to do a skimming sort of thing. So I would really encourage folks um, to either read along or, or uh, ask questions uh, about uh, what I'm verbalizing as we go. Uh, I just am not a big fan of regurgitating what the page says in front of you. So I'll kind of skip through it. Very good. Well, here's your clicker. So Wayne's great. Uh, his presentation is wonderful. We start our subcommittee meetings uh, each and every time with Wayne doing an update as to the status of the research and monitoring. Um, this is our last meeting. It was held at the Kalispell Tribe of Indians uh, Campus Center. They hosted us. It was wonderful. I really appreciate the tribe uh, uh, helping us with that facility. And so if you haven't been there, it's, it's just a wonderful place. Um, and uh, we had a real vigorous uh, group of publics attending and, and other agency folks as, as well as the subcommittee. So it was a, a pretty great meeting. We've been really working on, um, I guess, reinvigorating things in the Selkirk Cabinet Yak and with the understanding that as Yellowstone and NCDE progress on towards delisting, uh, we're next. <laughs> and so we feel that we ought to get going, uh, start focusing on some nitty gritty things that we need to do and, 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 and integrate things. Um, so with that, uh, we want to start us off. This is very similar to how we do our subcommittee meetings. A uh, little background information, what's happening with the mayors, and then we start getting into the nitty gritty with accomplishment and priority action. So that's where I'd like to take us today. So Wayne, you're up. Thank you, Mary. Um, there are always, in any of these uh, actions, there are a lot of people involved with it, and I'd like to just uh, kind of list at least some of the people that have been involved with the data collection, the data summary, and I won't run through all the names, but as always, there's lots of folks involved. Uh, as far as the talk today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a variety of topics, start off with an update on the augmentation program in the Cabinet Mountains, uh, review some of our research capture results, and talk about the monitoring of the collared bears in the area, spend some time on our hair snag collection, as well as reviewing uh, some of the genetic information that's come out of that that we've collected in the last couple years. Uh, and then I'm going to review some of the recovery criteria. And this is a, pretty much the same presentation with a few additions that I give at the <coughs> committee meeting and did so in early November. So uh, starting off with the augmentation program, um, we had two collared females that we placed in the Cabinet Mountains recovery area in 2014. Uh, in 2015, one of those bears was found dead. It appears that that bear was a natural mortality, uh, possibly killed by either another grizzly bear or maybe a mountain lion. Uh, the evidence there has to do with puncture wounds in the skull of the bear that was found at that time. It was in a, pretty much a backcountry area, no indication of human involvement in the death of that bear. Well, you might ask, well, what kills a grizzly bear? Well, you have to remember that this was a, a bear that we placed in the cabinets as a two-year-old bear at approximately 110 pounds in 2014. I'm guessing that in 2015 when this bear died, it probably wasn't much more than about 150, maybe 175 pounds tops. Not exactly a large animal roaming around out there with a lot of other large predators in the woods, which are capable of killing and eating grizzly bears. So we, uh, we had another bear that was uh, released in the Cabinet Mountains um, in uh, early August of this past year. Uh, the bear came from the Whitefish Ranch in the Northern Continental Divide. It was a two-year-old male. This bear weighed about 165 pounds. It was released near the Idaho-Montana border again in early August. This is the 18th bear that we, we have released in the Cabinet Mountains as part of the augmentation program. And you can see the sex ratio down there as well. So, um, interesting movements and interesting things going on in the cabinets this past year. 
Uh, we released that bear, as I mentioned, in early August, and about a week later, we had a lightning storm that came through that area and started a number of large fires. Uh, those fires burned for quite a while. In fact, even in late October, some of them were still burning. So just an indication of the size of the fires. Now, um, this particular bear, the red dots up there on the map indicate the path of that bear and the fact that it did leave the recovery area. It navigated its way through a variety of fires and I can't say that cause and effect that this bear was maneuvered out or responding specifically to the fire situation, but it is kind of an interesting set of coincidences in looking at tracking this bear and how it seemed to weave through a whole bunch of fires. The bear uh, ended up just north of Kellogg, Idaho. Uh, it was uh, in an area where there were certainly scattered residences along the Coeur d'Alene River, and it was seen a number of times. Uh, uh, there was an attempt to capture the bear by Idaho Fishing Game at at least one site uh, where the bear was seen. The bear didn't cooperate. It moved on kind of when the trap showed up. Uh, unfortunately, the bear was killed in late September uh, by a black bear hunter uh, who was hunting over bait. Use of bait in that area is a legal hunting activity. But in a case of mistaken identity, and the hunter did report the incident. <laughs> So, getting back to a little bit of a summary of what we know about the Cabinet Mountains augmentation effort and what's been going on there. Again, I mentioned we've transplanted 18 bears to the Cabinet Mountains over this 25-year period. Uh, we know that six bears that we've placed there have left the recovery or left the target area. One of those was recaptured and returned. Another one returned by itself and then it left, went somewhere else for a while, came back and ended up staying there. Five bears that we know are dead within a year and a half after the program. We had two bears that were natural mortalities, one from this past year. We had two bears that were shot and killed by people. We had one bear that was hit by train as well. So, kind of a, a variety of things happening out there. We've also pointed to several successes out of the program. I've got my family tree up here, and this is one way we kind of monitor the success of the program is through our hair collection and doing parentage from the DNA off of these bears. Um, oops, get the hang of this thing. Okay, this particular bear up at the top of the family tree, one of the founders, and this female over here are bears that we have placed in the recovery area. The particular bear at the center, top center, is a bear that has produced at least 10 first generation offspring, and I say at least because we probably don't know about all of them. And we know that this bear has also produced, produced 13 second generation offspring. I think we're also getting to the point where in the next year or so, I expect to see third generation offspring uh, out of these individuals as well. We're also moving males into the population, and I occasionally get the question about why we're moving males. Part of the reason has to do with our genetic tracking. Right here, we've got a father-daughter relationship, offspring from a father-daughter pairing, and offspring from a brother-sister pairing. Um, you know, in the, in the genetics of bears, at least initially, this may not be a big problem for bears, but in the long run, it could be. And therefore, we are placing bears in the area as well in an attempt to deal with some of these things and essentially broaden the genetic base of this population as we go. The goal or the hope is that also we are eventually going to see movement by native males from the yak or from adjacent populations into this area and that will then provide our source of genetic diversity rather than us continuing to move bears in there but in the meantime, we're going to continue to move bears. So, uh, we have an active capture program in the cabinet yak and the Selkirks. Uh, we have uh, moved or captured 10 bears this past year. We keep a running sample of radio collared bears. Uh, you can see some of the numbers there as far as where we've captured bears. Um, we uh, also have a management program that works there that also provides a few radio colored bears for us to track once in a while. 
and we do the monitoring on some of those management pairs as well. We also have a cooperative program with British Columbia, particularly in the Selkirks as well as in the Cabinet Yak, where uh, we have, uh, through Michael Proctor, a researcher in British Columbia, made, helps maintain a collared sample of bears in British Columbia uh, in the Selkirks portion uh, of that recovery area in, in British Columbia, as well as north of the Yak in British Columbia too. So we uh, keep collared bears there and we have a cooperative relationship going on. Just to look a little bit, uh, I got a lot of dots up here and uh, just to uh, maybe provide a frame of reference here, international border with Canada. Um, the uh, Idaho Panhandle is right in here as well. Montana to the right, Washington to the left to give you some orientation if you can't pick that up, at least from the slide from where you're viewing. So uh, this is the radio data from the bears that were collared during 2015, plus any previous data associated with those specific animals. Uh, lots of dots, but I wanted to point out some kind of significant movements and we'll Go around, we'll start at the upper right hand corner and work our way around and maybe address each one. We identified a bear this past year that went from the Yak and came back, but made it all the way up across Highway 93 into the southern Rockies of British Columbia. Uh, an adult male, this is their first time we've identified a bear with telemetry going that far, and uh, it was a bear that went up there and then came back as well. Anyway, a substantial distance moved into what potentially might be another recovery area, or at least an extension of the Northern Continental Divide into British Columbia. Coming around a little further, we have identified, and this is the second bear that we've identified, moving from the Yak population into the Selkirks, taking up residence in the Selkirks. So we've at least got some, identifying some movements between these recovery areas. Um, I think this was an interesting one as well, and I think it's been useful, at least as far as our work in British Columbia, knowing that we've identified, and I think this is the first one, Tony, that we've identified a bear moving from the South Selkirk population unit in British Columbia into the Kettle Granby. Uh, that bear remains over in the Kettle Granby, at least at this point, and we'll continue to monitor it and see exactly uh, where that bear takes up residence in the future. We've got another bear down here that made it uh, from the Selkirks into the cabinets. And this is the second indication that we've had uh, through either telemetry or genetics of a bear making it from the Selkirks to the cabinets. We've also got one that has gone back and forth here. This is our first indication of a bear moving back and forth with telemetry between the cabinets and the act. And uh, it may not seem that significant. Well, you say, well, Cabin TX, a recovery area, just uh, going across the river there. But interestingly enough, because of the small populations and because of where those bears live in each one of those areas, this is the first time that we've documented a bear moving back and forth between the Yak and the cabinets. This is an adult male as well. So, uh, moving along, we have an active hair collection program that we do through uh, placement of corrals with remote cameras. We also collect hair at rub trees and of course all of this goes in and is our genetic basis for monitoring in this recovery area but those are some of the techniques we use and we check those uh, regularly collect samples. Uh, just a little bit of some preliminary results in terms of what we got out of 2015. I mentioned that at our hair corrals we place remote cameras. So even though we don't have the genetics data back, we at least get some indication of what's going on at some of those sites through the pictures that we get. So we placed about 200 corrals in the Selkirk uh, area uh, during 2015. At 31 of those 200 sites, we got pictures of grizzly bears. Furthermore, out of those 31 pictures of grizzly, or 31 sites with grizzly bears, we got seven females with young, and out of those seven females with young, three of them were females with cubs of the year. Females with cubs of the year are really important because that's our metric for judging some of the demographic recovery criteria within this area. 
Uh, you can see we expended some effort on corrals uh, in the uh, cabinet yak. Uh, probably the more notable thing or thing that I wanted to bring out there is the number of rubs that we are looking at. These rubs were placed there as part of the 2012 mark recapture estimate that was done by USGS, specifically Kate Kendall's work. Uh, they identified and set up a number of rubs. We've continued to run those rubs, collect hair at as many as we can. Uh, that study put up around 1,300 rubs. We're continuing to sample about half of those. And what we did was that we hydrated those, looking at the ones where we got or where Kate's work got grizzly bears. We continue to look at those, as well as the ones in close proximity that we can easily sample when we go to those sites, collect hair, and see what we get out of them. And so leading into that, here's some of our genetic results that we got. And again, this is the work that's come back from the laboratory uh, on those genetic results. And uh, in uh, the Selkirks, uh, we had 62 corral sites during 2013, 2014. And you can see some of the numbers of bears, two females, two males at four sites. Uh, a little bit of, we're doing some rubs over there. But the Selkirk total, we're only looking at about six bears that we identified with this technique. Doesn't seem like much. Well, there are probably more bears out there, and I think you'll see that from the indications on the 2015 work, we got a lot more pictures of grizzly bears. The point being, I think we're learning a little bit about where to place some of these sites and where we can have better luck with obtaining information. Let's go down to the cabinet yak. We play 70 corrals. We got, uh, we got five sites that turned in five different grizzly bears. The important thing that I'd like to focus on a little bit here is that we ran about five to 600 of these rub tree sites during 2013, 2014. Now in 2015, we expanded that, but out of those five to 600 sites, we were able to identify 30 different grizzly bears. And I wanna put this in context a little bit, 30 different grizzly bears. Well, if I'm talking to Frank here about the Yellowstone, 30 grizzly bears doesn't seem like much. And you saw that the population at least, uh, or the error bars for the estimate of the Yellowstone population was greater than probably our total population by some factor uh, in the cabinet yak. So we're, we're dealing with some small sample sizes and small population sizes. But the point being <coughs> is that with this work, with the rub tree work, we were able to identify 30 different grizzly bears out of what's potentially a population of about 50 bears, or 60% of the population we identified simply by going to rub trees. It's something that we're going to look at. It's a great source of genetic information for looking at diversity, for looking at migrants, that sort of thing. It may be a means of monitoring the population going forward as well. So that's something we're looking at. And uh, hopefully we'll have some better results going forward. But if you can pick up 60% of the bears that are out there, I think that shows some promise. Okay, speaking of that work uh, that uh, USGS done, it has been recently published. It is available at least online, should be in the next uh, Journal of Wildlife Management. Uh, probably the big take home message from that work is that the population estimate was roughly 48 to 50 bears depending upon exactly how you calculate that number. Uh, correspondingly, pretty tight confidence interval on that as well. And that 48 to 50 bears is roughly equally divided between the cabinets and the yak portions of the recovery here. So I'm um, gonna mention a little bit about the recovery plan and some of the criteria that are in the recovery plan. We uh, use the recovery plan for particularly the demographic criteria, and I report these at uh, every subcommittee meeting, and it's kind of our metric of tracking where we are and kind of how things are going. Uh, population goals for the Selkirks and the Cabinet Yak are roughly 90 to 100 bears. Uh, those are judged by the number of females with uh, cubs that are in the population. Uh, that's also judged by the distribution of those females with cubs. We also look at the mortality, and, uh, and also for these recovery areas, because these numbers are so small, the recovery plan addresses that 
we need to have these populations linked to other populations. Uh, scientific data modeling suggests that a population of 100 animals not connected to other populations is unlikely to persist over time. Therefore, the recovery plan criteria that we need to have linkage between these, this population and other populations that are out there. So, uh, again, we talk about judging or looking at the number of females with cubs on a six-year running average. We look at the number of BMUs that are occupied by females with young. Notice the distinction there. Females with cubs and females with young. If it's a female with yearlings or two-year-olds, it might count for occupancy, but it wouldn't necessarily count for females with cubs, and you'd see the importance of that coming up. We calculate a minimum population size based upon the number of females with cubs that we see during the last three years, or essentially a reproductive cycle. We apply some correction factors based upon the citability of those, and also um, the uh, number of adult females in the population. And I also might mention that we subtract out any mortality of adult females that might occur along the way as well. We get to a population, minimum population size, and then we apply our percentage criteria to judge whether or not mortality is meeting our goals or exceeding our goals. So we'll go through a little case by case, uh, a little uh, discussion. We'll start with mortality. Uh, these are the mortality figures uh, for the Selkirk Mountains, and I've uh, put them up here. The upper one, obviously, is males and females. The lower one is British Columbia versus the United States. And uh, you can see that in terms of the numbers here, uh, where we are, uh, I think the one striking thing I would mention out of this is that a lot of the mortality that occurs in this recovery zone occurs in British Columbia. And uh, we'll have to talk about that some more, Tony. You can see a little bit about the distribution of those females with young sightings, where they occur. We have subunits within the cell carts where we uh, apply our management criteria uh, in order to judge distribution of females with young. And in the cell carts on the U.S. side, our goal is to have seven of ten identified BMUs or subunits within there occupied by females with young. And we're meeting that on the U.S. side of the cell curves. Our, uh, our mortality, we've had 10 human-caused mortalities during the last six-year monitoring period. And we'll also use that in our calculation here along with females with cubs. And you can see here that in the last six years, um, our female with cub count is 11 females with cubs. We average that over six years. We're down to 1.8 females with cubs per year. Our goal is six females with cubs per year. We're below where we need to be. Um, we've also had 10 mortalities and applying to the minimum population estimate that came out of that. We're running at around 3.7% calculated mortality and we're meeting our recovery goal in that particular case. However, 40% of those mortalities have been females and therefore that portion of the recovery goals are not being met because of female mortality. And that's more than where we would like to be. I'm going to do the same thing with the cabinet yak. And I think we all need to remember here, because I hear once in a while, and I'll just make sure that everyone's aware, we have two separate recovery zones. Even though the subcommittees meet together, I still hear once in a while that, okay, it's the Selkirk Cabinet Yak Recovery Zone. Well, no, I'm sorry, that's not the case. It's two separate recovery zones. So we have two separate sets of calculations and criteria that are going on here. So we're going to look at uh, mortality in the Cabinet Yak. And again, human-caused mortality. And I failed to mention that earlier, but the calculations are based upon human-caused mortality. Certainly other mortality, natural mortality going on out there, but we're managing human cause mortality. So we've had, uh, you can see the, uh, the type of mortality that we've had going back uh, to 1980. Uh, I just might mention that uh, we had a spike of female mortality, particularly uh, in the early 2000 uh, vicinity in there. More recently, that mortality is skewed heavily towards males. 
And while the mortality may not have decreased dramatically, it has decreased some, it is certainly skewed towards males, which is something that a population can support a lot better than female mortality. Distribution of females with young within the recovery area. Again, we have subunits, and uh, we have pretty good distribution of females with young in, throughout the Yak portion or the northern uh, area of this of this recovery zone. It's a little more clustered in the cabinets portion. Of course, that's the area where we're doing the augmentation. Uh, our goal is to have 18 of 22 BMUs occupied. We're currently at 12, so we're not quite where we would like to be. 10 human cost mortalities, and you can see the distribution of those human cost mortalities on the map as well, with probably more of them occurring in the Yak or the northerly portion of the recovery area than the southerly portion. Back to this same graph, we're going to apply it to the, uh, to the cabinets population here as well. So uh, during the last six years, uh, we've had 14 females with cubs. That works out to an average of 2.3. We want to be at six. We're a little below where we want it to be. We try the calculation. We get to a minimum population of around 35 pairs. We apply uh, the uh, average mortality over the last six years to that. We're running at about 4.9%, which is higher than where we'd like to be. However, Going back to the female mortality, only one out of 10 mortalities were females. And so that's actually a good sign. We're meeting that. And because of that, uh, we're actually, we'll, we'll talk about it next, but that's a good sign that enables uh, the population to actually grow in the meantime, even though we're in excess of our postulated or our, our mortality. If you remember from Frank's presentation yesterday, he talked about having a higher allowable mortality for males in the Yellowstone than for females. Well, I think we're seeing that here too. You can get away with more male mortality. It's when you start losing females that it becomes a, a problem for the population. So we have a radio collared sample uh, in the cabinet yak that we use and the cell currents as well. Uh, to gather survival information, uh, known fate monitoring is the term that's applied to this. We keep track of the number of bears we have collared, whether they live or die, and what they die from. We can use that uh, to apply to our management goals as well. If we know what bears are dying from, and if there's a management solution to reduce some of that mortality, well yes, we can apply it, and this helps us direct that management in the right places. We get uh, reproduction data as well that goes into the modeling process that uh, establishes trend for the population. So we've been uh, tracking trend in this population. The first estimate that I made for trend in the population was back in 1998 using known fate monitoring. Uh, what I've got is uh, the red bars are our estimate of the, the trend in the population, and if it's below the green line, we're in negative territory. We're, we're going downhill. If it's above the green line, we're in good territory. The limitation that we have here in the cabinet yak is sample size. And I didn't have enough of a bear pop, enough days of radio collared bears prior to 1998 to really even start this calculation. The error bars are pretty wide, so in order to continue this calculation, I summarized all the data based from 1983 to the year you see on the map. So it's a cumulative trend based upon 1983 to 1998, 1983 to 2002, 1983 to 2008. Just full disclosure here, letting you know exactly what's going on. But I think by using all the data, and when we've gotten out here to 2014, and we're showing a growth rate of 1.4% in the population, I think it's a relatively telling figure uh, about where we're going with the population. We went through a big decline. This corresponds to the time when we were losing a lot of females in the population. And that's why we were driving this, this population into decline at that point in time. Since then, we've gotten a much better handle on female mortality as well as a variety of other things going on. 
and we're back into positive territory. So, there was a little bit of discussion yesterday about the recovery plan and about some of the things that are going on in the recovery plan. So I thought maybe I'd just outline a few things that are going on. These are all tasks within the recovery plan and things that are going on in the cabinet gap and the cell parks. So we have motorized access management uh, that's been integrated into the forest plan. We're making good progress there. The expected goal for completion of access management and achieving all the targets for core, for open road density, for total road density are expected to be achieved on all the national forests by 2019. We have food storage orders on all four national forests. Kootenai, Idaho Panhandle, the Lolo, the Colville, all of those national forests have a portion of these recovery zones and we have, we have food storage orders. We do conflict management on both of these areas using the guidelines that are uh, in the recovery plan. We have conflict managers, one in Idaho, located in Bonners Ferry, that deals with a portion of the cabinet yak and the cell parks. We have a position in Libby that deals with the cabinet yak. That's a conflict manager that does a variety of different things, not only capturing, dealing with problem bears, but a lot of conflict abatement by providing electric fencing to local residents, providing know-how and how to set up an electric fence, physically going to the site and helping people put up an electric fence to protect those damn chickens. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we have garbage can loader program. We do genetic monitoring in both of these recovery areas. The genetic monitoring is important not only for linkage and knowing, okay, we've got bears moving from these areas, and that's great, but that's not gene flow. Bears moving back and forth until you establish gene flow, you're not having linkage and having an impact on those populations. We can also study diversity. And I don't know if any of you might have noticed with Frank's presentation yesterday, he showed a graph about diversity of various populations and where Yellowstone was on the decline of things. There was a dot in there for the Silkirk population that was below the Yellowstone population. And, I, and I'm not sure, but I think the Silkirks, at least as far as continental bear populations, might be one of the lowest in North America in terms of genetic diversity, roughly in the mid-50s. So we're monitoring the genetic diversity of that population through our hair snagging program. And you know, we've actually seen some bears moving into the cell groups and we've documented reproduction. And that's the gene flow that's occurring and I think that we will, over time, expect to see some improvement in the genetic diversity of the South Cell Group population. Uh, linkage areas. We have a published paper out where how we identify linkage areas between the Selkirks, the Cabinet Yak, the Northern Continental Divide, British Columbia, a variety of other places. And it's not only identifying those areas, we have plans to protect those areas. And I, I should go say we move beyond plans. For instance, as one example, uh, a couple years ago we signed a conservation easement with a timber company. Uh, that owns 28,000 acres in the Cabinet Yak. That conservation easement identifies or has protections for subdivision development, road management, a variety of different things that will keep that land as productive timber land and not turn it into subdivisions that can be a problem for bears either for movements or mortality sake. We have a habitat monitoring and improvement program. I sit down with the Forest Service and we talk about projects, timber harvest projects, that will create food for grizzly bears. And some people might say, well, you know, I've heard that before. Our service does that regularly. We are monitoring those areas as well to see what comes back on those spots after timber harvest. Not only are we doing the design and the layout, we're doing the monitoring to see what happens after that and be able to show that what we planned is working or not working. We do a variety of foods monitoring. Uh, we have 27 years of berry production data in the cabinet yak. We're extending that to the yak area, or excuse me, to the Selkirks area as well. We're also recording isotope data from our captured bears, looking at major food groups that are being used by bears in the area. 
We monitor bear health through BIA measurements, and this is where we, on a captured bear, we determine the fatness of those animals. Well, that's important for reproductive health of the population. It's important to compare between our area and other places to see, okay, are these bears putting on fat in the same relationship as some other places? Are there interesting relationships between fatness of bears and food production? Are there relationships between fatness of bears and cub production? So, uh, we monitor public attitudes also in the recovery plan. In 2008, we did a survey of the entire recovery area through a phone telephone survey inquiring about public attitudes related to grizzly bears. We got some rather surprising results. I'll let you take a look at that, but there was a lot more support for grizzly bear recovery out there than I think we imagined before we did the survey. We do a lot of I and E work uh, aside from that, and we coordinate our activities with British Columbia, and you've heard me talk about collared bears and working with the folks in DC. So, um, sorry for the long litany here, but the question did come up, and so I'm attempting to address it. So, you might recognize this. This is, you might say, okay, are you doing some of the same things in all these other recovery areas? In the Yellowstone, the Northern Continent Divide? These sound like the same things you're doing? And I'll leave you with this question. Is it working for you? Thank you. Question? Tony. Um, what about the potential for prescribed fire? I know we're going through a lot of concerns about fuel loading post-fire suppression. But to sort of accelerate recovery, have you thought of prescribed fire, use of prescribed fire? Um, question has to do with prescribed fire, and uh, yes, I think, you know, there is some interest in